So introducing Karen. Karen Sukahara is the Regional Fiduciary Wealth Manager leading BNY Mellon Wealth Management's fiduciary team in California. She joined the team in September of 2021. Karen received her BS at the University of California, Riverside, and her JD with Pepperdine, University of Law. Prior to where Karen sits now, she was in wealth management industry and practiced law for over 20 years. I might also add, she is a Cancer Support Community Legacy Advisory Council member with us. We're very happy to have her for her first year with us. Um, and fun fact, she was formerly a professional show dog handler of champion German dogs. So without further ado, Karen, I'm going to pull up your screen and get your presentation. You so yeah, so Libby, if you could turn the presentation to slide number two. Um, and the title on that is Introduction, Key Principles of Charitable Giving. So just by a little bit of way of background, um, you know, I practiced law for 20 years before I joined um, financial services 10 years ago. And so some of the things that I'm going to be talking about today, I'm actually drawing from professional practice when I was a practicing trust and estate planning attorney. And some of the things that I'll be talking about today will be things that I've seen, you know, while working for a financial institution. And, you know, I work with clients, our minimum client size at BNY Mellon is $10 million of investable assets. So certainly some of the client scenarios that I've seen are larger, more complex situations. But the one takeaway that I will say is that, you know, charitable giving can come in many different forms. There are many different ways that you can give to a charity. And so we're going to start today by talking about, you know, some of the simplest and most straightforward methods of giving. And then we we're going to work our way up in terms of complexity. So that's the way that this presentation is designed. And what I'm going to ask you to do is hold any questions that you may have until the end of the presentation, just because I know there's a lot of material to cover and I want to try to get through as much of it as we can. So, as I said, there are many different ways that you can give to a charity. You can either do direct, you know, cash or check donations to a charity or to a private foundation. You can give to donor advised funds or you can do it via trust instruments, such as a charitable remainder trust or a charitable lead trust. And again, we're gonna cover all of these different ways of gifting in this presentation. Certainly, I think the most efficient way to do charitable giving and really leverage the full benefit of what it is that you're giving is to use low basis appreciated assets to make your charitable contribution. And the reason for that is it allows you to avoid capital gains tax, and it also allows you to attain a very high charitable income tax deduction. And we're gonna walk through an illustration using actual numbers later in this presentation so that you can visualize what I mean here by you know, creating tax efficiency and at the same time fulfilling your charitable intent. Now, I often work with business owners or entrepreneurs who are experiencing a liquidity event. And, you know, in those situations, to avoid capital gains tax, the person has to donate the assets before you incur the legal obligation to sell those assets. So, for, for example, if you're a business owner and you hold, you know, private company stock, you have to make the charitable donation before you enter into a binding letter of intent to sell the stock. So generally speaking, if you're in that situation, maybe you're planning to sell your business or you're an entrepreneur who's you know, planning a, a liquidity event, you wanna start planning about 18 to two years before you, um, you know, are going to actually have the sale of the business. You need sufficient runway to be able to do that type of planning 
if you're going to try to benefit a charity or if you're going to try to benefit your heirs through some sort of a wealth transfer technique. And that's something that I commonly see with people is they come to us a little too late to be able to really do effective planning. They've already signed the letter of intent. The sale is already underway and we're really limited in terms of our options. So if you're a business owner, you definitely want to start planning ahead early on. So the other key principle here to remember is the amount of the charitable income tax deduction that you can take. It's limited to your adjusted gross income. So generally speaking, you can take a charitable deduction of up to 60% of your adjusted gross income for cash. And if you're using non-cash, such as you know, stock or um, you know, other assets, it's limited to 30% of your adjusted gross income. So that's the charitable deduction that you can take in the year in which the charitable gift is made. But you have the ability to carry that forward and deduct the remaining value of your charitable your donation for up to five years. And this is a little bit different than what we saw last year. So when I did this presentation last year, I was talking about the CARES Act which essentially said that last year, you can make 100% uh, of your charitable contributions to a public charity, um, you know, were fully deductible in 2021. Uh, it had to be a donation to an actual charity. You couldn't, um, you know, take 100% cash contribution to a DAS, for example, and it required that you make a special election. So anything that you contributed last year in excess of 100% of your adjusted gross income, you were allowed to carry over for five years, subject to a 60% AGI limit. Okay, so why don't we move on to slide number three. And we're gonna start talking about the timing and the types of assets that you can gift. And we see this quite a bit um, working in a financial institution. And I'm sure Libby and Andy see this too, where there's sort of a last minute end of year rush for people to make charitable contributions. It's almost like people don't really think about it until year end. Um, and then we have panic clients who call us and say, hey, I'm intending to make a charitable contribution. You know, um, how late can I make a gift of securities or mutual funds or whatever the asset may be, um, you know, can we get the, the donation done in time? Um, so that's what I'm going to talk about here is timing and types of assets. So if you're making a charitable gift by check, it's effective when the check is delivered or mailed, as long as the check clears in due course. So even though the check theoretically, you know, the donor could stop the payment at any time um, before it's presented for payment, it's not treated by the IRS as an incomplete gift. The IRS says, as long as you, um, you know, mail it, as long as the check's in the mail, um, a gift to a charity is good as a donation for the year in which the check was delivered or mailed. So that's a little bit different than if you were gifting, let's say you wanted to make a, a gift using your annual gift tax exclusion to say a child or a grandchild. It's a little bit different um, when you're making a gift to an individual. It has to actually you know, be received by the recipient if it's a non-charitable um, recipient, but you know, it's good enough if the check's in the mail, if it's going to a charity. Now, there's a treasury regulation that refers to mailing a check or a stock certificate. Um, and that reference is commonly understood to refer to the U.S. Postal Service. Now, it's a little bit different when you're mailing your tax returns. Um, so there was a section of the Internal Revenue Code 
that modified the definition of delivery service to also include Federal Express and permit that you could mail in, um, you know, your tax return via FedEx, and and that would be, you know, a permitted delivery form. Um, that has not been extended to include charitable contributions. So if you're coming down to year end, don't FedEx your contribution to the charity. We advise that you use the U.S. Postal Service whenever the date of mailing a charitable contribution is important. And I would also advise against the use of a private postal meter. So the tax court has ruled more than once that um, despite the date on the envelope where the document or the you know, donation was not received in a time frame that mail postmarked by the U.S. Postal Service ordinarily would have been received, you know, they'll disallow it. So don't use FedEx, don't use a private postal meter, put your check to your charity in regular U.S. Postal Service mail. Um, that would be the preferred method. And if you're really running up on time, you know, you can also pay by credit card. So the Internal Revenue Service has ruled that a gift occurs when the donor becomes indebted to the credit card issuer. So it's when the charge is made, not when you pay the credit card bill. And I know a lot of charities also now accept contributions via text message. And again, it's similar to um, using a credit card. If you're gonna make a donation via text message, it's complete when the text message is sent. Hopefully, I don't have any procrastinators here. Hopefully, all of you plan to do your charitable deductions much earlier in the year and not wait until the very end of December to try to get your charitable deductions in. So, moving on to slide number four, gifts of security. And we run into this a lot at most banks and financial institutions. So we'll have clients who will say, okay, I want to make a gift of securities rather than cash. And we'll talk about this a little bit further here in just a few minutes. And you'll see why a lot of people will prefer to make a direct gift of an appreciated security rather than selling it and then donating the cash um, resulting from the sale. So when you're making a gift of securities, a contribution of property is complete when the donor basically relinquishes control of the asset to the charity. So in the case of contributions of stocks or bonds, um, this occurs when the donor gives up control of the security and can no longer revoke the authorization to transfer it. So if you're giving securities, um, it can be a little tricky to value, okay, you know, for the purpose of taking the charitable deduction, what's the value? And the rule is the deduction for publicly traded securities will generally be the average of the high and the low trade on the day of the gift. So I know right now the stock market has been extremely volatile and the value of the contributed security can vary significantly um, even over the course of a day. So again, it's going to be the mean of the high and the low on the trade date um, on the date of the gift. And the donor's charitable income tax deduction will reflect the value on the date that the transfer is deemed to occur, not on the day that you gave the instructions to your broker. So it's the actual date of the transfer. Now, when you're um, transferring an actual stock certificate to a charity, uh, you have to be a little careful here, and I'll explain why. 
Um, so the contribution of the stock is effective on the date of the mailing. So if you're mailing it by U.S. mail, um, it would be the date that you mail it or upon delivery. So if you're hand delivering it, let's say that you're bringing a properly endorsed stock certificate into the charity's office, it would be the date of delivery. Now, one caveat here is you never want to mail an endorsed stock certificate because it is a negotiable instrument. So you don't want someone to intercept the delivery. Um, so if you're going to mail in a stock certificate, what you want to do is mail the stock certificate um, and the fully executed stock power in separate envelopes by certified mail. And the date of the gift in that situation would be the date that both are mailed, if they're mailed on the same date, or the date of the last mailing, if they're mailed at different times. Now, there's a special timing consideration if what you're donating is a mutual fund interest. So mutual funds are transferred a little bit differently than stocks and bonds. Um, they're not transferred through the Depository Trust Corporation or what we call at banks the DTC system. So the shareholder does not actually hold a certificate of ownership in a mutual fund. So what happens is that gifts of mutual funds can often take much longer to complete because we're really at the mercy of the mutual fund company involved in its process for transfers. So generally speaking, if you want to make a gift of a mutual fund, you want to notify you know, your um, financial advisor earlier on because it can actually take several weeks to effectuate the transfer. And most banks and financial institutions will have cutoff dates that they'll advise you of. Um, so, you know, they may tell you, please, if you want to make any gifts of, um, you know, stock or um, bonds, notify us no later than December, whatever it may be, 5th, 10th, um, that's our cutoff date. But you'll often notice that with regard to mutual funds, they'll have a much earlier date. And that is because of the extra timing that's involved to ensure that the transfer occurs prior to December 31st. So in order to count as a charitable uh, donation for a calendar year, it has to occur on or before December 31st. So that's why you'll see that um, deadlines are often um, you know, noted sometime in December. Mutual funds, it's not unusual for the cutoff date to be maybe mid-November. So please, please, please don't wait until the final days of December to try to make a gift of, um, you know, anything that needs to be transferred by your bank or your broker. Okay, so I'm going to move on now to slide number five. And this is an example showing you the advantage of making a gift of securities directly to the charity. Um, and what you want to do is you would want to, in order to really maximize um, the impact here, you would want to make a gift of an appreciated security. So, this example here, let's say that you have stock in Apple um, and you bought it, your basis is $1,000. And the current value of that stock, the fair market value or FMV, is now $10,000. And for purposes of this illustration, we're assuming that the donor is in the 37% income tax bracket and 20% capital gain rate. So this is an illustration that really highlights how it's tax efficient to use low basis appreciated assets 
to make charitable contributions. So when you look at what's being gifted to the charity, the charity is getting a charitable gift of $10,000 of Apple stock. Now, how much is that contribution really costing you? If you were to take that stock, and let's say that you were to liquidate that stock with the intent that you would then turn around and take the proceeds and donate that to charity. So let's the illustration here. Um, when you run the calculation, the current fair market value is $10,000. You subtract your basis of 1,000. That's a $9,000 gain. And you have, um, you're gonna incur a capital gain rate, 20%, which results in capital gains of 1,800. Now, when you combine that with what the ordinary income at 37% rate of 3,700, you can see that the tax savings here is going to be $5,500. And it would be even more if you are subject to the 3.8% surtax on net investment income tax. So there is an additional $342 of savings potentially if you're subject to that 3.8% surtax. So the cost of your taxable gift in this illustration is if you're not subject to the 3.8% surtax, it's $4,500. It's actually a little, just a little bit over 4,000 if you are subject to the 3.8% surtax. So the actual cost of the charitable $10,000 gift is a little over $4,000. So that demonstrates to you the value of gifting low basis appreciated assets because it allows you to avoid the imposition of the capital gain tax. And at the same time, you achieve a high charitable income tax deduction. So moving on to the next slide, slide six. So again, when you're making terrible contributions of securities, terrible gifts have to meet substantiation requirements. So for example, if you're gifting closely held stock, so in some of the scenarios that I've seen where someone is selling their closely held business and um, they wanna make a gift of their closely held stock prior to sale, you have to be able to substantiate the value. And typically that's done through an appraisal of the stock. And we mentioned this in the context of securities, but it can also arise in other contexts as well, such as when someone is seeking to make a gift of artwork or you know, something where the valuation requires substantiation. So typically we're engaging the use of an appraiser um, and the Timing for the appraisal is something that we also have to take into consideration when we're talking about the timing of the gift. So the second point here about the amount of the income tax deduction and its substantiation depending on a few different factors. Um, so the type of the property given and the type of charity that is selected um, you know, we will see those illustrations later in this presentation where I'm going to be talking about things like DAFs versus private foundations um, and gifts of, you know, publicly traded stock versus privately traded stock. And again, the general rule is that subject to certain limitations, Whatever the amount is that's not currently deductible in the year in which the gift is made, you can carry it over for up to five subsequent years. Okay, so now we're going to move on to slide number seven. And this is gifts to private non-operating foundations. 
So what is a private non-operating foundation? A private non-operating foundation is a foundation that grants money and distributes funds to other charitable organizations. So the foundation's primary goal is to make grants to nonprofits, not to run its own program. So, you know, an example of this would be a family that sets up a private family foundation. You know, those are examples of private non-operating foundations. So many of the clients that I work with will establish their own family foundation and it would be deemed to be a private non-operating foundation. The whole purpose is just to give money to other charities, not to do direct um, you know, programs. So when you're making a gift, a charitable gift of appreciated property, such as real estate, closely held stock, to a, non a private non-operating foundation, you only receive a charitable deduction equal to a cost basis of the asset. So that's an important consideration. Um, and it's sometimes one of the reasons why clients of mine choose not to establish a private non-operating foundation and make the gift that way. So there's a, an exception though that exists for charitable gifts of qualified appreciated stock. Um, where it's eligible for a deduction equal to the fair market value. So, you know, what do we mean by this? We're meaning, you know, stock in, in gen generally speaking, publicly traded stock. So, for example, if you give shares of Apple or Tesla, you receive a charitable deduction that's equal to the fair market value on the date that you gift the stock. But if you gift closely held stock, such as shares of your privately held company, you only get a charitable deduction equal to your cost basis. So now we're going to move on to slide number eight, which talks about qualified charitable distributions, or what we call QCDs. And this is something that I commonly see with my clients. So again, you know, I'm, I'm working with high net worth individuals who have IRAs, but they really don't need um, to, to receive their required minimum distributions. They have to take them because they're at an age where they're required to take their minimum distributions but they don't need the income. They have sufficient income from other resources. So a QCD is a distribution by a person who's 70 and a half years or older. Um, you can give up to $100,000 directly from your IRA to a charitable organization. And it qualifies as satisfying your R&D requirements and the amount of the QCD is also excluded from your taxable income. So if you took, um, let's say you were taking your required minimum distribution and then you turned around and then made a charitable contribution. The problem is it's gonna count as taxable income if it passes to you first. So what a QCD allows you to do is it allows you to it from your taxable income if you make the distribution directly to the charitable organization. And it does have to be a charitable organization. You cannot make the distribution from the IRA to a donor advised fund, what we refer to as a DAF, or a private foundation. You have to make the distribution directly to a qualified charity. So this is, again, a technique that I frequently see my clients doing, is making a QCD, so QCD distribution directly to a charity. Okay, now we're going to segue into some of the more complicated structures 
Um, so we're starting to sort of ratchet up here at the level of sophistication. We're going to move on to slide number nine, private foundation. So many of my clients will come to me and say, I want to establish a private foundation. And oftentimes when I have conversations with them about why they want to establish foundation, we find that we're able to accomplish their goals and objectives without having the administrative burdens of running a private foundation. So what is a private foundation? It's basically a tax exempt charitable vehicle. So it's like establishing a corporation or a trust. Basically, you establish this legal entity that is tax exempt. And again, it can be in the form of a trust or it can be in the form of a corporation. And then you gift assets into the private foundation. So when you look at the flow chart there on the right hand side, it's pretty straightforward. The donor creates a private foundation and then you donate assets to fund the private foundation. And then the private foundation then in turn makes charitable distributions to the charity. So it looks pretty straightforward, but there's a lot of administrative um, housekeeping that's associated with something like this. So you have to make distributions every year. You have to make a distribution of a minimum of 5% of the um, underlying assets of the charity to support charitable causes. And there's, you know, different returns that are needed to be filed. So there's separate um, income tax filings that are required. Everything is potentially um, public as far as you know, the filings are concerned. There's what we call a form 990 that the foundation is required to file, which basically gives a lot of information about the, um, the distributions that have been made out of the foundation, administrative expenses, who's involved, who did you give money to? You know, so there's um, a lot of transparency involved with a private foundation. Um, so, you know, sometimes I like to say that private foundations are um, not exactly private. Uh, and I do work with a lot of clients where privacy is a concern. Um, they're concerned about people finding out how much money they have, who they're, you know, currently supporting as far as charities. They don't want people discovering this information. So, you know, sometimes for that reason, the private foundation is not the right um, you know, way for them to proceed with fulfilling their charitable objectives. The other thing that you have to remember, too, is that there's a certain level of IRS scrutiny associated with private foundations. And so I've had a number of clients who've said to me, oh, well, I've heard that with the private foundation, I can put my kids on the payroll and basically pay them, you know, a high salary through the private foundation. And that's actually an area that is um, sort of a red button topic for the IRS. They scrutinize private foundations very closely because in the past there was abuse in terms of salaries and compensation of employees of private foundations where the family would establish a private foundation and use it as a vehicle to subsidize a family member. Um, so there are strict rules around compensation. The compensation has to be commensurate with a number of different factors. Um, so, you know, for that reason, I, I discourage people from establishing private foundations for the purpose of trying to, um, you know, subsidize family members. It's not the way to go. So now we're going to move on to slide number 10, which talks about an alternative to doing a private foundation. And this is the use of the donor advised fund or DAF. So what is a DAF? It's basically an account 
that you open. And there are many different financial institutions that have donor advised funds. Um, so, for example, one of the ones that we commonly use is Fidelity. And essentially what it is, is it's an account um, that has a charitable purpose. And you irrevocably transfer your assets into the account at the charitable organization. So when you look at the flow chart on the right hand side, you'll see the donor opens up the account with the donor advised fund. They transfer assets in to fund the account. And then the donor advised fund at some point can choose to make grants to qualified charities. And you'll notice it says per the donor's recommendations. So this is where it's a little different than a private foundation because with a private foundation, the donor can direct where charitable gifts or grants will be made to. But here, the donor can only recommend. And the donor advised fund has the ability to override that decision if they so choose. But I will say that that is, um, you know, typically not the case. Usually, they will um, respect the donor's recommendations with regard to grants to charities. So, you'll see here that the donor retains advisory privileges with respect to the investment and the distribution of the funds, but they don't absolutely direct it. They're able to contribute highly appreciated qualified securities. And we're gonna talk here, there's another slide that we're gonna to move to in a moment here that shows you know, some of the advantages and disadvantages of the private foundation versus the donor advised fund. But basically you get a bigger current charitable income tax deduction on the donor advised fund as opposed to the private foundation. And the way that I explain that to clients is with the private foundation, you have that additional element of control. The donor gets to decide where the money goes. Um, and in a donor advised fund, the donor has the right to advise where the funds should go, but they don't have the absolute right to direct it. So, you know, with that additional control comes a cost. And that cost is the current income tax deduction that's allowable to the donor. So, you know, the assets here have to be used for a charitable purpose. Um, you know, you can only distribute for the benefit of public charities. So, for example, if you wanted to make grants directly to an individual, maybe, you know, you want to pick who receives a scholarship, you know, you can't do that through the donor advised fund, typically you would do that through something like a private foundation. So we're gonna move on to the next slide, which lists the donor advised fund and the private foundation side by side so that you can see you know, the, the pros and the cons of the donor advised fund versus the private foundation. So there's a lot of considerations that go into determining which is the appropriate vehicle. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of them. I've already highlighted that there's a difference in terms of the allowable charitable deduction. So that element of control results in a lower charitable deduction on the private foundation. And I've already talked about just the startup costs and then also the administrative, you know, considerations of running a private foundation versus a donor advised fund. So the general rule of thumb when I'm meeting with clients is, you know, I will ask them, you know, how, how involved do they want to be? You know, a lot of times they don't realize the amount of work and effort that's associated with doing a private foundation. And the other thing is, how much control do they want over the ultimate distributions? 
if they want to get really granular down to an individual level in terms of grant making, then, you know, typically they'll opt for the private foundation over the donor advised fund. But I will say, I think probably 95% of the time, my clients will opt to do the donor advised fund. And I recently met with a client last week who said, oh, donor advised funds, aren't those the poor man's private foundation? And I had to correct him because we have clients who have 50, even $100 million in their donor advised funds. Um, so it's not a matter of how much the person is looking to give. You know, there's other considerations to which one is the appropriate vehicle. It's not a matter of how much are you giving. It's a matter of, you know, which one best achieves your objectives. So now moving on to slide number two. I'm sorry, slide number 12. So now we're starting to move into a discussion of different types of charitable trusts. And this is where we're really now starting to hit the top of, um, you know, what in terms of complexity. So we started with straight gifting, we moved into donor advised versus private foundation. And now we're going to talk about charitable trusts. And there's really two basic types of charitable trusts. There's charitable remainder trusts, and there's charitable lead trusts, which we're going to get to um, later here in the presentation. Um, and I know I'm kind of running up on time, so I'm going to try to cover this as quickly as possible. So I'm probably going to um, abbreviate some of the information here. But basically, what is a charitable remainder trust? A charitable remainder trust is an irrevocable trust meaning that once it's created, it cannot be changed or amended, except perhaps by court order. Um, so it's an irrevocable trust where you establish the trust and you contribute assets to that trust. And what happens is that that trust will make annual payments to the grantor or to another person that the grantor selects. And for a term not to exceed 20 years or the duration of the grantor or the other, the person that the grantor directed that payment served to be made to um, for that person's lifetime. And then at the end of that period, the remaining trust assets get distributed to a charitable organization. So probably the best thing for us to do would be to maybe um, advance down to the slide that shows the illustration of the charitable trust. So I'm sorry, because I can't see what page, I can't see the, the, uh, the video. Um, Andy and Libby, it'll be the page that says charitable remainder trust, and it says NIMCRET overview at the top. Okay. 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 Thanks. All I right, just guys. think it'll be easier for everyone to visualize. So I'll kind of walk you through. Um, I'm not going to walk through the specifics of the NIMCRET. I'll just talk about that very high level at the end here. But so in essence, what happens when you have a charitable remainder trust, again, it's where the assets of the trust pay out to the grantor or someone else that the grantor specifies for either a certain term of years or for their lifetime. And then whatever is remaining at the end of that term, get, that goes out to the charity, okay? So the annual payment amount has to be at least 5%, but no more than 50% of the value of the trust assets. And the value of the remainder interest that's passing to the charitable organization has to be at least 10% of the initial value of the trust. So to get a little more granular, the trust can be structured either as a unit trust, 
So we would call a charitable remainder unit trust a CRUT um, for short, or it can be an annuity amount. And that's called a charitable remainder annuity trust or CRAT. Um, so what's the difference? A CRAT is where the amount that's getting paid out to the grantor or the person that the grantor designates over their lifetime or for a fixed term of years, that's an annual fixed payout. So it's got the word annuity in it, and that's exactly what it is. It's a fixed annuity percentage or amount. And then the CRUT, which is the unit trust version of it, that's where the annual payout is a fixed percentage of the value of the trust assets every year. And it will fluctuate depending on the annual fair market value of the trust assets. So there's two different flavors of the charitable remainder trust. It can be a CRUT or it can be a CRAT. And you know which one is the right one for the, the donor? It, it depends. Um, there's a lot of different considerations when we're looking at what would be the optimal choice for the clients, we typically run different financial projections for them to show them the difference between the two um, and work really closely with their attorney and their accountant um, to make sure that we're all on the same page with regard to what's the best option for the client. So, you know, what are the advantages to a charitable remainder trust? Um, I've used this technique very successfully with clients where they've had assets such as I had a client who had a an apartment building and you know they were getting on in years and they said okay we'd no longer want the headaches of managing an apartment building we're getting too old for this um, yes we could hire a, an apartment of real estate management company to assist. But I mean, ideally, we'd like to simplify our estate. And we are very charitably inclined. You know, we would like to ultimately have this passed to a charity, but we still need the income from this, this property. We want to be able to still have an income stream, but ultimately we want to also benefit a charity. The problem is we bought this property so long ago that our basis in the property is really low. And, you know, we don't want to do a 1031 exchange because, again, we don't want a comparable real property. Um, we don't want the headaches of managing it. We just simply would love to be able to just sell this and, you know, get an income stream. Um, but we don't want to have to also get hit with the capital gain. So, you know, potentially what is the right structure or vehicle to accomplish our goals? And so the um, answer was doing a charitable remainder trust. Because when you donate the apartment building into the charitable remainder trust, the trustee of the trust can then sell the apartment building and not incur capital gain. So that was the advantage to doing it structured this way um, as opposed to selling the building um, and getting hit with the capital gain and then eventually donating the property to the charity. So they're getting an income stream. We did it in 20 year charitable remainder trust. They're getting an income stream off of that for 20 years. And then at the end of the 20 year period, it goes to the charity. So when we look at um, there's an illustration on the next slide, which shows you the charitable remainder trust. And in this example, we used um, a value of $5 million. And we compared it to um, no planning at all. So in the first column where it says planning, we established a charitable remainder unit trust. And in the second column, no planning, that shows you what happens 
when you don't do any kind of a charitable remainder trust. Okay, so in this, we're assuming that we're using stock um, and we're assuming that this is closely held stock, so there is no cost basis associated with it. It's a zero basis stock. And when you look at the assumptions down at the bottom, it says we're assuming the person's in the 37% bracket with zero cost basis on the stock. Um, and then, you know, there's assumptions here on, um, you know, the, uh, the amounts that are ultimately going to the charity. Okay, so let's compare the two. We set this up in column one as a charitable remainder trust and transferred the $5 million of stock into the CRT. We're looking at, there's, um, you know, a sale of that stock. There's no capital gains in this scenario, because again, when you transfer it into a CRT and you then sell it, there's no, no gain triggered. So the proceeds from the sale is the full 5 million. You get, um, you know, the, Terrible deduction of 500,000 in the first year, and then you get to carry over the value of the deduction over the next five years. You can see here that, you know, the ultimately there's a next slide which summarizes <clears throat> what happens here. So you get the benefit of significant tax savings. So the total tax savings in this scenario of doing the CRT, it's 2,100,000. The after-tax income payment that you receive is going to be over $4 million. And the total that you get to contribute to the charity is about 1.4. So you can see that there's tremendous value to be able to to do something like a CRT as opposed to just doing no planning, whatever, and selling the stock. Um, and then let's say the client has terrible inclinations, you know, after the sale of the stock, um, you know, turning around and doing the charitable contribution, then it's, it's, you're much better off doing the CRT. And I know I'm running up on time here. It looks like we've got five minutes left. So I'm just going to just quickly talk about the charitable lead trust, which is the reverse of the charitable remainder trust. So in the charitable remainder trust, there were payments going to the donor and then the remainder going to the charity. The charitable lead trust is the opposite. That's where the you establish an irrevocable trust, and the charity gets the benefit of annual payments for a certain amount of time. And then the remainder goes either back to the grantor, or typically it'll go to other people that the grantor may designate. So it's the reverse. The charity gets the income stream, and then it reverts back to the grantor or the grantor's heirs. And you may have heard of a charitable lead trust because this is the vehicle that Jackie Onassis used to reduce her estate tax burden. So when we look at some of the illustrations here for a charitable lead trust, um, let's see, this would be Slide number 20, Libby and Andy. So if you want to jump to slide number 20. We're yeah, talking. So you'll see there's a, a chart here showing a payment schedule. Um, I had talked previously about how we help our clients by showing illustrations of the different types of estate. Um, charitable vehicles. And so this is one example of the type of illustration that we use for our clients. So this is illustrating the benefit of doing the charitable lead trust. And in this particular scenario, 
where we were funding a charitable lead trust, again, with $5 million in assets. Um, what you'll see here is that you have over three and a half million passing to the family members free of any gift or state tax. And without touching the use of the client's lifetime estate and gift tax exemption. Plus, you've got nearly $6 million going to the charity and the grantor receiving a $5 million income tax deduction. So you can see how doing something like a charitable lead trust can definitely, definitely leverage um, you know, the amount that's going to charity and at the same time benefiting both the grantor in the form of the immediate income tax deduction and ultimately the family members of the grantor as well. And with that, I am ending right on time. Um, thank you very much. It's a little challenging presenting simply by phone because I can't see your faces and, and engage with you that way. Um, hopefully you have found this to be informative. Um, and so I'm gonna just see if anybody has any questions. Karen, fantastic job. You did a great job, especially without being able to see. But yes, these are these presentations are for you. So if, if anyone has questions, feel free. I need to know if I can get in contact with you. Do you work in this area in the Bay Area here? I do. I'm actually based here in San Francisco. And okay. um, yeah, I run our fiduciary business on the West Coast for Bank of New York Mellon. Um, so I am on the road traveling quite a bit. Uh -huh. um, I was in Los Angeles, Seattle, and Newport Beach last week, um, but I'm back here at home in the Bay Area. Um, and, uh, you know, you're certainly welcome to reach out to me. Libby, you can, you know, share my, my email with them. Um, with everyone if they have any follow-up questions. Sometimes people are a little shy to, to speak up on a, a group presentation. Well, I will I'll, do that, thank you. Uh, well, your number eight described me perfectly. And um, this past year, we had someone new do our taxes and we're told that, no, you cannot do that. And I said, yes, but I read that I, read that I could. No, it doesn't matter, you can't do that. And you told me that I was right. I can do that. So I don't know if, I mean, my, I'm looking for, we're looking for a new accountant because our regular one um, stopped doing taxes and we had to just throw a ball up in the air and choose somebody. But um, anyway, I will get your, your contact information and then you can tell me whether you are or not doing this kind of work or I should find an, a new accountant and you can give me a name, that would be great. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks yeah, I can certainly, yeah, I'm happy to, to give you a referral to an, an accountant. So when right. you said you were talking about a scenario, was it the, a charitable trust that you were looking at or? No, no, no it's the QCD. Oh, the QCD. I'm, yeah. I'm yeah. over 70 and a half. Mm -hmm. I got mm -hmm. a checkbook from Charles Schwab and wrote mm -hmm. only charitable donation eligible checks out of it and mailed them in. And then when we went to do our taxes, they went, oh, now you can't do that unless you itemize. But we didn't, we weren't eligible to itemize. And that's what the article said. I mean, are, will you, are you telling me I can do it whether itemized or not? The money went? Well, okay. So there's some questions there. I, why don't we take that offline? Because yeah, I, yeah, that's fine. I need a little bit more information. Sure. But so, so you're, Okay, yeah, I'm just wondering what, what the thought was with there with your accountant, but we can, we can chat about it offline. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Barbara, yeah. any other questions? 
Nope. Well, you have you have Karen's email address in the chat box, and I'll also follow up with an email with that as well. But Karen, you certainly have a lot of knowledge to give us, and we are very lucky to have you here at CSC, a part of the Legacy Advisory Council group. So thank you for the time. Sorry for the technical issues. And for all of you, if you have any other questions now or in the future, um, Karen is one of about 12 members of our Legacy Council group who are here for you as resources. So please don't hesitate to reach out to me. My name is not Rob, although it says that. I'm Libby Eppinga, or reach out to Andy. Karen, thank you so much. Thank You're you very, very welcome. Yeah, it was my pleasure. Thanks, everyone. Have a great evening.